Thank you, Dwayne, for doing that song. That's one of my favorite songs. I love it. <clears throat> Please bear with me. I've got a cough drop in my, my mouth here. Our family's been sick since December, but I'm happy to say we're on our way to being healthy. Yeah, Taylor's pumping his fist back there. I just wanted to... Uh, <clears throat> I made a PowerPoint. First time I've ever made a PowerPoint, so bear with me. Very simple, only Bible verses, no moving things or anything. But everyone knows it's a big holiday today in the States, right? And in parts of Canada. It's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Biggest holiday after Thanksgiving, as far as I can tell from everyone that's on uh, Reddit. But it's Super Bowl Sunday. It's when the two best teams in the NFL are competing for, as the Americans like to say, the world championship, even though all the teams are from the States. But it's Super Bowl Sunday. I remember the first time I saw the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 13. I was 13 years old. It started the year I was born. And I saw it at St. Mike's Hospital down in Toronto. My dad was having major surgery, and we were kind of living in the hospital while that was happening. Mom, I guess, was extremely worried, nervous, as wise would be. I was just bored because I was in this hospital all the time watching the Super Bowl. And there was an ad that played in Super Bowl 18 for the first time from the U.S. Army. If you're my age, you will remember it all the way through college and university, played at every sporting event all the time on every channel. It would be all that you can be. And it was usually like a young kid who comes to uh, his dad and says, I'm joining the army, and his dad looks stricken. And he says, but dad, I, they're, they're going to help me become an engineer. They're going to help me be all that I can be. And then there was a nice tune, be all that you can be in the army. No one? Yes. Dwayne remembers it, right? Yes. Dwayne remembers it good. I thought I was a little, I was a little worried. Okay, well, you kind of you can see what it is. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. Last time I got up to preach was in October. I started with the same verse. I love this verse. For I know the plans I have for you, de declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I talked about how God had promised the Israelites when they went into uh, slavery in Babylon. All the promises he had for them. To prosper them, to not to harm them, to give them hope and a future. Today I want to talk about the flip side of that. I talked about what God promised, what God was giving. Now I want to talk about what we need to do to grab hold of that promise. The promise to prosper us not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. As the verse says, God wants the best for us. He has given us everything we need to prosper, everything we need to have hope and a future. And just like the U.S. Army, he wants us to be all that we can be. He wants us to unlock that potential within us. He wants to unlock that potential. He wants you to you can be. You know, I was at a hockey meeting uh, a few weeks ago. I have it once a month. Uh, I'm an ice scheduler, get the handing out practice and game ice and stuff. It's a job no one wants to do, and I was foolish enough to volunteer to do it. But I was at this hockey meeting. And my family, right from the time we were young, I've said we are recreational hockey only. Right? We play our 32 games plus a tournament a year. We have fun with our friends. That's as far as it goes. But the first person that I got, got up to talk came up and said, oh yeah, so all of you guys are here. I know a lot of faces that I've seen through my years. All of our kids are finished with hockey. And you know what? I look around and I think of the $200,000 I've dropped on my kids' hockey over the past 10 years. <laughs> Everyone in that room except for me and one other guy went, yeah. I was absolutely boggled. I thought hockey was expensive for us, and we maybe spend $1,000 a year. So that's $10,000 over the course of their career. But each of these people in the room spent about $200,000.
But that's what it takes to make it to the NHL now. The kids that are in the NHL, Connor McDavid and those guys, they started when they were seven years old playing hockey full time. I remember talking to a kid that I coached Ben and Taylor's teams through the years to spend time with them. And there was one kid on our team, Marcus, he was now playing midget AAA. He wanted to go to the NHL. I remember running into his mom at uh, the, uh, oh, sorry, do I need to stay here? Okay. I remember running into uh, Marcus's at the swimming We were having Taylor's birthday in, in August. And there happens to be three hockey rinks attached to the swimming pool. And I said, oh, were you at the pool? And she says, no, we were at the rink. This is Marcus's fourth hockey camp this summer. Can't wait for it to be over. You know what? This is what it takes. By the age that they're 15 or 16, these kids that are trying to get to the NHL are moving away to be billeted with a family. They're leaving their own family. These families are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. They have devoted all of their time and energy to make it to the NHL. Matthew 22. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Here's another favorite verse of mine. I probably used it last time I was up here too. Usually I like to condense it. I like to simplify it down to love God, love others. Which makes sense when your point is how simple. You to follow just how simple. But Jesus here, when he says to the Pharisees, he did not simplify it. So I want to read the whole first one. Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. These hockey players that are trying to make it to the NHL, they go all in. All their time is devoted to it. All their thought is devoted to it. They go to the arena. They skate. They, Sidney Crosby shot hundreds of pucks each night into his family's washing machine. They're all in. And if you truly want to unlock the promise that God has for you, if you want to truly unlock the potential God has for you, you have to go all in. Just like these hockey players going all into NHL, you have to go all in. And Jesus said that. Love your God with all your heart, with all your, your, your soul, and with all your mind. I'm not talking about spending all of your time running around doing church activities. We're here to worship God, right? Yeah. We're not here to worship church. Amen. Men? Do you hear, see the distinction? Yeah. There's a fine line between worshiping God, worshiping church. That's another sermon for another time. But that's all I'm talking about. I'm not talking about spending all your time running around doing church activities. I'm talking about giving your all to God. Amen. God's not wanting us to spend 40 hours at work and then 40 hours at church, and then 40 hours with our family. He's not into time management, right? What he does expect of us to unlock our potential is that we devote our heart, our soul, and our mind to him. We go all in. And what that means is when you are at work, when you are at church, when you're playing hockey, when you're with your family, when you're with your friends, co-workers, on a date, all of the time and in every heart, your soul, and your mind, if you want to unlock that potential. There are three practical things that means. One, read your Bible. Two, ask lots and lots of questions. And three, do what it says. Like reading your Bible, I had open heart surgery 12 years ago. All my friends know this. My surgeon came to me and outlined all his qualifications and ended with, I am the best. They got me from France. You are in great hands. And it was apparent that he had put the requirements in to become a world-class surgeon. And I felt at ease. I felt I was in good hands. 
If he had come to me and said, yeah, you know, I looked up a little bit on the internet, and, but I'm just going to go what I know is right in my heart. I know what you, you want. I'd be like, yeah, I want you to go back to medical school and figure out how to do this properly. And this is what God is talking to us. You can't go all in and unlock your potential without doing the required learning. And you have to go back to that source. As Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you don't know those words, you can't grab hold of this promise to prosper you, to give you a hope and a few the source and absorb it. And I'm not talking just for people that have never read the Bible before. I will make a confession. I don't read the Bible enough. I really don't. A lot of time as older Christians, I've been a Christian for 20 years, we tend to go, we know what it says. And we forget to go back and refresh ourselves on a regular basis. Even that world-class surgeon, he had probably done hundreds and thousands of open heart surgeries. He has to go back on a regular basis and take refresher courses. Yet a lot of times as older Christians, we can go, yeah, yeah, we know what it says. We know what it says. And we don't go back. We need to refresh our minds. We cannot love God with all of our minds if we're not refreshing those minds. We can think we know, but if we keep going back to the well, then our thinking can be, become God's. If we don't go back to the well, we don't go back to the Bible, our thinking becomes our own. Yeah. And there's a very famous proverb, uh, 1412, there is a way that seems right, but leads to death. That's telling us that when we think we're right, we'd better double check that. We really need to. And the only way to double check that is to go back to the source and read your Bibles over and over again. Also ask lots of questions. I don't, hold on. Nope, okay. <laughs> I don't have a verse up there. We can't do it by ourselves. There are many, 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 many one another passages in the Bible. I'm not going to go into all of them. We can read them ourselves. But suffice it to say, we need people in our lives to help us see what we have a hard time seeing. Right? We need people to give us advice, but there are two ways we can do this. The right way and the wrong way. Easy, right? The right way <clears throat> is by taking responsibility and being humble with advice. The wrong way is by either not be taking responsibility or by not being humble. When we take responsibility, we take the initiative. No one cares about us as much as we care about us. God. Seriously. I love my wife. She loves me. She can't know everything that's bothering me as well as I can. She doesn't know what I'm struggling with as well as I know what I'm struggling with. And I need to take that initiative. People are there to help and God tells us to help others. But if we don't take that initiative to go seek the help, seek the proper advice, right? Then we're depending on other people, which we need other people's help, don't get me wrong. But have you ever watched what a shepherd really does? Because we talk about shepherding each other, shepherding the flock, helping each other. Most of what a shepherd does is sit around and watch. Sheep are very docile creatures. They love to stay congregated, and they really only run away when there's danger. And so when there's danger, the shepherd needs to go after them. But the shepherd doesn't stand there and hand feed each one of those sheep. Right? He doesn't sit there and go, oh, you know what, Fluffy, you're looking a little thin here. Let me get some more grass and feed you. They do that. A lot of times we think shepherding means it's someone else's responsibility, right? And that's the wrong way to think about it. It is our responsibility. If you don't believe me, uh, I didn't write it down, but in Luke 16, verse 19 to 31, 
You can read it at some point. It's Jesus telling the parable about the rich man in Hades, where he's down in Hades, in hell, burning. He asks Abraham to give him just a drop of water, please. And when Abraham says, sorry, no, he says, then let me go back to my family and tell them about this. If I come back from the dead and appear to them, they will repent. Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. If that's not good enough, they can't be convinced. That is a warning to each one of us to take responsibility for our own Christianity. To be going out seeking God at all times in our life. Not waiting for somebody else to do it. If we give up that responsibility, we don't take initiative, then our walk with God can become very, very bitter. We can be saying things like, no one comes to help me. She told me to do that when you do something wrong. It's her fault. It's his fault. It's their fault. That's a sign you're not taking responsibility for your own Christianity. And that's not what God wants for us. You know what? He's saying it's up to the rich young man's family members to seek God for themselves. And it's up to us to do what needs to be done. We need to go out, seek that advice. No one can read the Bible for us, right? And there's very few people that will chase us around to try to figure out what we need. We need to take hold of that responsibility and initiative. And we need to go and get advice from many different godly perspectives. And then go back to the Bible to make sure the advice was proper and we understand it properly. You know what? It's best you got to talk to a lot of different people with godly perspectives because I don't know everything I don't know if you think you know everything I don't right you need to ask the right person if you need advice on your marriage go find somebody with an awesome godly marriage to talk to with your kids find parents that are awesome if somebody that's a good football player I don't know you ask somebody you don't go to your doctor to get financial advice Dwayne, can you look at this mole on my back? Uh, No, he's the financial advisor. I'm not going to go to him for doctor advice either. Ask the right person in humility. It's easier to be humble when you know you're asking someone that knows more than you do. Ask that right person. Also, ask in humility. Humans have this very, very nasty habit. It's called confirmation bias. And confirmation bias means we tend to go to people, congregate with people, that will tell us what we want to hear. That's not the way God's plan works. A lot of times when you read the Bible, it'll tell you things you really don't want to hear. When you go talk to godly people, you may not hear things you really want to hear, but you need to do it with a humble attitude. And then you need to many people especially if something seems off to you and then don't just take the advice and go do it you're missing a step what's the step pardon pray Pray is a good step not the one I was thinking about but two steps (laughs) go back to the Bible like Acts 17 who in Acts 17 was it the Bereans were of more noble character because they took what Paul and the apostles said to them and said, okay, I'll take that with humility, but now let me go back to the scriptures and check to make sure it's it's right. Read your Bible. Get advice from many, many different people perspectives. And then go back to the Bible to make sure it's right. And then the third point, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Blah, 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 blah. Then they will be blessed in what they do. We know this verse. That's why I did the blah, blah, blah. You can read it all. But the point I want to make, I don't have a lot to say about it. It's very self-evident. If you've gone through the effort of reading the Bible, if you've gone through the effort to go talk to a bunch of people to get advice, if you've gone through all that effort and getting advice, then as as anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, like someone looking at his face in the mirror, if you do all that effort and then don't do it, you're kind of stupid. Sorry to be blunt. 
But do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says and you will be blessed in whatever you do. Okay, so when you're all in, when you're giving your, all your heart, soul, and mind to God, that means reading your Bible. It means go and asking lots of questions, getting a lot of advice, and then putting it into practice. You know, uh, sorry, here's a segue. Ben uh, was, was going through his room the other day, and he found some uh, little diaries that Laura kept when the kids were little babies. Starts off with like Ben was born 13 pounds, no, 8 pounds 13 ounces, that would have been a big baby. Right? On November 11th, 1997, Taylor was born on August 27th. And it talks, has a bunch of little anecdotes in there. And uh, it talked about him playing the piano. And it's wonderful to hear Ben playing the piano now. His favorite songs are Beethoven's Fur Elise and Stand By Me. Two different songs, but it fills the house with song and fills me with happiness. It's wonderful to hear him playing the piano. But it wasn't always that way. Anyone who's got kids that have had piano lessons, guitar lessons, I help you if it's drum lessons, it's not that way. It's many, many years of very painful, painful listening to Fireman Fred, Fireman Fred, George the Giraffe, George the Giraffe, over and over and over again. Julie's laughing. And many, many, many painful, uh, excruciating, boring recitals. When you're learning something, though, you start from the basics. But as humans, we will seem to want to play. We want to have it all now, and we want to make it the biggest ever. You know, as a church, we want a church of a thousand people next week. In our arrogance and pride, we want things big, and we can use excuses that we're doing it for God. But that's not how God sees it working. Another verse from James. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. <clears throat> Can you get any simpler than that? I don't see God saying, make huge, big plans. He's saying, religion that I find pure is taking care of the very needy and keeping oneself from being polluted. If you want to unlock your spiritual potential that God promises you, start simple and build from there. As humans, our pride always wants to do things bigger, but God doesn't care about bigger. God doesn't care if we worship in a massive cathedral or in a house with just a few people. It's not wrong to dream big for God, I'm not saying that, but unlocking your potential does not mean we need, we need to build huge projects. Usually if we're building huge projects, it's so that we can look good, so that we can tell people, look what we did for God, right? But what God says is religion that he finds as pure and faultless is to take care of the very needy. Help the needy. I'm extremely grateful to Rob and the people that run Hope. They do a great job and we're very fortunate to have them doing that work. I was very fortunate to be able to deliver a single Christmas hamper to a single mom and her five-year-old daughter. They were extremely grateful and it brought joy to my heart. But Rob and the people that run Hope, they have full-time jobs, and they don't have the time or resources to put together more than two or three small projects in a year. But they do a great job with those two or three projects. But if we're relying solely on those Hope projects to look after the orphans and widows, the needy, then we're missing the whole point of this verse. They are great, but there are many food banks, many soup kitchens, many shelters, many, many charities that need volunteers on a regular basis. We don't need to reinvent the wheel and we don't need to create some huge project in order to worship as God sees as pure. We just need to get out there 
and look after those widows and orphans. James uses this as an example because who is more needy, especially 2,000 years ago without any welfare, than orphans and widows? But he's talking about taking care of the truly needy. Not just looking at ourselves and saying, woe is me, I need a lot of help, I need a lot of help, take care of me all the time. No, he wants us to go out and do that. And keeping oneself from being polluted by the world, God wants us to share his good news, right, church? He wants us to go out and share the good news. He wants us to go out and make disciples. He doesn't want us hiding in our church, doing church activities. He wants us out there helping. And that means getting dirty. You know what? We sometimes think that once we're saved, we don't really need to work hard at being a good Christian. You know? We sometimes think we're protected from getting spiritually sick. But you know what? Just because you become a doctor doesn't mean you're immune to germs when you go in that ER. They got to wash their hands. Laura just got a new job uh, in September at a school, an elementary school. Part of that job is she's kind of the school nurse. They don't have a real nurse, but office, and everyone with a bloody nose, with vomit for them, with any sickness, comes to Laura, and she takes The people that work with her are always kidding her that, do you have any fingerprints left? Because she's washing her hands so often. Yet she's been sick since September. She's on antibiotics to finally try to get rid of this because she's getting viruses all over the place. It's the same with us when we're out helping the people that need it. There is, someone told me that, you know, the more time you spend around a particular person, the more you become like them. God wants us out there helping the people that need help, that need spiritual help. He wants us making disciples. But he also says we need to be careful. We need to prepare ourselves. How do we do that? Go back to my first point about reading the Bible, getting advice, and that. We need to get back in the Bible. But we need to start small and build from there. And it's not just for when we become Christians again, even when we're Christians for a long time. I know a guy named Bill. He worked in a law office with a thousand lawyers. And for a variety of reasons, after 20 years of working there, he decided for his own good, his family's good, for a variety of reasons, he needed to leave that law firm. So he went off and started another thousand person law firm, right? No, he didn't. He went back, he hung his shingle up, a single law lawyer in this office, doing whatever work he could get. Starting over is not bad. Just because you're at this point, or as a church we're at a big point, it's not bad to say we need to get back to basics. It's not back, it's bad to get back to basics and build from there. Starting over is not bad. Start small, start on the basics, get them right, and then be all that you can be. My last point here is remember, you will mess up, but that's okay. As I said, Ben found the diaries of the boys' lives, and we had fun going through those things. It was, Taylor says, could I hit a golf ball at the same time I learned to walk? I said, yeah, but you were goofy gripped, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, but there was one story that we talked about one time when Taylor was three or four and Ben was seven. We went bogganing in Roy Park, on the Roy Park Hill. It's about the size of a two-story house, not huge at all. But it was the day after we had an ice storm. So we got there, and the hill was covered with ice. The boys could not make it up at all. So I spent the whole time grabbing onto them, holding onto the twoggins, and trying to get up this hill. We tried 20 times. We'd get two-thirds of the way up, and then we'd slide all the way back down, not on our toboggans. The kids were killing themselves laughing, because they didn't have to carry people up. I was not laughing. We did 20 tries at this, ended up making three runs. But we also had a fantastic memory. And loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind is hard, and it can be overwhelming. And like walking up that hill on that icy day, 
You can try a ton of times certain things and you will fail. You will fall down. Ben, uh, I, you know how Howard Christianity is in that, in that book? Uh, ben was in the car. We were driving the Morrisons down to Toronto. I guess you guys were visiting your family in Brampton. We were going down because Ben, all he wanted to do is go on a train and a boat and a plane. So we went down to Center Island. We took the train from Ajax or something, took the ferry, and then he got into one of those little airplane rides. So he got to be on a train, a boat, and a plane. But we were driving down, and he was getting grumpy. It was like 9 at night, and he usually went to bed at 7. He was probably 3 years old, I'm thinking. And we say, try to, to calm down, you know, calm down, just calm down. And he goes, Daddy, I'm trying. My brain wants to calm down, but my body doesn't. It's too hard. And you know what? Being a Christian can sometimes feel like that. It can feel overwhelming sometimes. God never promised that it would be easy, right? In fact, he promised the opposite. <clears throat> Humility is absolutely necessary. Jesus once said, why do you call me good when someone calls me good? There's only one that's good. He was trying to say, don't call me good. I'm not good compared to God the Father. Wow, if Jesus was that humble, how much more humble should we be? There's a business axiom that says you can never truly succeed in business or in life until you truly know how And loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind is hard. And just like going up that hill at Roy Park, we will fail at times. God promises we will fail. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Amen. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Anyone know who Elon Musk is? Yeah. Okay, Elon Musk. In an interview that uh, my business partner showed me, he talked about his first project ever. His second project was PayPal. Have anyone heard of PayPal? Yeah. It's pretty big. His first project no one's ever heard of because it wasn't successful. His first project never even made the investment back. And about 80% of the way through, he says, I knew it wasn't going to. But he persevered and finished it because he said he could never have done PayPal if he hadn't finished that first project. The act of finishing something gives you a sense of accomplishment and it teaches you things. It also gave Elon Musk the, the uh, contacts, it gave him the experience. And that's what God, James and God is saying here. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may, may be mature and complete. If you want to unlock your potential, that God, follow this advice. Persevere. And personally, I've taken this to heart. The past few years have not been especially easy at work, and to be honest, here at church. Not been easy. And there are many times that I've sat there wishing that it was easier, wishing that things had gone a different way. But we've persevered. All of us have. We've persevered. And when you persevere and let perseverance finish your work, you may be mature and complete. Last October, when I got up to preach, I got up because it was my month and I really didn't want to do it. My heart wasn't in it. I'm sure if you look at the video, if we have it, or the audio from there, you'll hear a difference. Today, I'm happy to get up here. You know, do I wish things had gone differently, easier? Yes. But perseverance is finishing its work. And it's making me mature and complete. We can sometimes play that what-if game. What if my business partner didn't have a concussion? What if things had gone differently here for the past two years? What if I had followed my dream and become an actor and a musician? What if I had taken that job in London, England for slave wages that, that I could have had when I was 23? What if I had married someone else? What if I never had kids? 
What if I went to a different church? We can play those games. And that's when we wish our life had been easier, more comfortable. But there's no promise it would have been better. The only thing that you can say is, it could be different. And all I know after 25 years of marriage and two wonderful boys that have stressed me out and have loved me and have filled me with pride, with many friends here, knowing there I have a God that loves me, I am very grateful that I've persevered. And if you want to unlock your potential, God promises that he will unlock the potential. He promises that you can be all that you can be, but you have to follow his plan. You have to be all in, go all in for God. You have to start simple, build from the basics up, and you need to persevere. We're gonna take communion. I've got a little bit further of this that leads into communion, but before we do that, Michael's gonna come up and lead our hearts in a song. Uh, let us break bread together. <laughs>